welcome back. This is the Thomas Fine Tees video series in preparation for the SEMA operational case study exam in August 2018. This is produced by Ultimate Access and we're going to look at video six today, the intangible assets accounting standard. My name is Sandy Hood and the IAS 38 features within the F1 syllabus in area B. And here you can see it listed within the indicative content under part 2 B. Sets out the accounting treatment and disclosures to be applied to the recognition and measurement of intangible assets. IAS applies to intangible assets that are not dealt with specifically within any other standards. So it doesn't include goodwill, for example. Research and development expenditure. We would treat as expenses in the year that they are incurred, but only the development expenditure, which satisfies all of the IAS 38 criteria, can be capitalised. By that we mean that we can treat that as part of an asset within the statement of financial position rather than as an expense within the statement of profit or loss. So here we've got the um, statement of profit or loss and we can see that there may well be a certain amount of money that's included in the cost of sales which actually may well be something that we could capitalise as an intangible asset. And similarly here we can see that they do have some intangible assets. And what would happen is that we would reduce the cost of sales and we would increase the intangible assets. And then over time we would amortise the intangible assets and that effectively would uh, mean that we would be charging it to cost of sales over the life of the intangible asset rather than at the time that the uh, cost is incurred. So you can see here that when you have reduced your cost of sales, you will increase your profit for the year. And so with a higher profit for the year, the retained earnings will increase and of course the reduction in the cost of sales will mean that the intangible assets will increase so that the total equity and liabilities will still balance with the total assets on the statement of financial position. So what are the criteria? Well, pirate is a good way to remember them. They need to demonstrate that there's going to be some probable future economic benefits. We must intend to complete and use or complete and sell whatever it is that we are developing. We must have the resources available to complete and we must be able to use or able to sell what we are developing. And the technology must exist to enable us to complete. And those expenses that we incur, we must be able to identify them as separately and measure how much it's actually cost us. P-I-R-A-T-E, pirate. Now, if we're looking at assets, and this is an intangible asset, then we need to refer back to the conceptual framework to remind ourselves of what any asset must be. A resource controlled by the entity as a result of past events and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity. And then we would add that the separately identifiable and the cost or value must be measurable reliably. So in Thomas Fine Tees, we can have a look and we can see that there were, there were several clues. Um, here we've got the development of new black uh, tea blends, 
The company has been at the forefront of market development, encouraging the popularity of green teas and several in flavoured infusions. So we've, we've got a reputation in this area. So if we're looking at this market development, then we would want to see how it would fit the conceptual framework. Is this an asset? Well, can we say that this is a resource, market development, uh, that's controlled by the entity? Difficult to be able to control it, isn't it? We can certainly say there were some past events, and there may well be, but we can't be sure that there will be economic benefits that will flow to the entity. It's possible that we can measure our costs reliably, but I would think market development is a difficult one to measure. And it may be that it's very difficult to separate out those costs. And then looking at it from a point of view of the IAS 38 criteria, we would go through the pirate. Are there probable future economic benefits? We think so. Um, do we intend to complete and use our market development? Do we have the resources? Are we able to use or sell our market development? Is it technically feasible to complete the market development? And can we attribute our expenses measurably to it? So you begin to get the feel that not always do we meet all the criteria. Now here's something that's uh, particularly useful for those of you getting ready for this exam. When I spoke to the examiner, she said that even if you identify that one of the criteria has not been met, you should look at all of the criteria, because otherwise you'll be leaving your marker with very little to mark. So although if you were at work and you were looking at a IAS 38 scenario, as soon as you've identified one criteria that we don't meet, you would stop in this exam. Please keep going and address all of the pirate criteria. Another clue is that we've got Rav, who's uh, keen on designing production lines, and he's installed one already. So it's quite possible that he may well be looking to produce one for green tea. And if, if that's the case, we would be looking at this design, we'd be saying, well, okay, is this a resource controlled by the entity as a result of past events from which future economic benefits can be expected to flow and can the costs be measured reliably and identified separately? And in this case, I think we could say yes. A design for a new production line for the green tea would meet the conceptual framework criteria. Would it meet the IAS 38 criteria? Well, we would have to see the detail within the unseen. But given the description that I've given you, I think it would generate probable future economic benefits. It is something that we intend to use. We would have the resources to complete it. We would be able to use it. And it's technically feasible to complete it. And we could ring fence and identify clearly those expenses that we've incurred specifically to develop this design. So in that case, I think we could call it an intangible asset. So be on your guard. I think a, a new production line for green tea is a possible in your exam. And sure enough, we will be able to transfer it. And we can see in here that we have had intangible assets um, and that we the value has gone down by a million DLAN dollars uh, from 2017 to 2018. Other bits, yes. Each, each blend has its own recipe and the recipe is the company's trade secret. You know, certainly in some other aspects of the preparation for this exam, we might call that a core competence. And some of the popular brand leading blends are blended to cope with the varying types of water. So that's more of the company's trade secret. Now, 
would we regard this as um, something that is rather like what the pharmaceutical companies do? Well, what they would do is that they do have intangible assets, but they generate patents which give them a 20-year life whereby they are the only company allowed to sell that particular uh, product. So that might be a, a similarity between Thomas Fine Teas and the uh, drug pharmaceutical company that manufactures drugs. When you look at the accounts of companies, and here we've got Betty's and Taylor's, a very uh, well respected company in the UK that produces the Yorkshire tea brand, they do not show intangible assets on the, on the face of their balance sheet. They, they produce their accounts to UK standards rather than to international standards. But there's no intangible assets there. When we look at Twinings, a much bigger organisation, there really isn't much in the way of intangible assets as far as the blends of tea are concerned. So, not from the evidence provided by the two key tea bag producers in the UK. So let's look at the criteria for IAS 38. It meets them, doesn't it? The, the secret recipes that Thomas Fine Teas have got meets these criteria. And we would assume that it's possible that uh, the expenses are attributable and measurable. So... They may have a problem separately measuring out the costs, which could be one of the reasons why they don't. Or they may wish to avoid patenting because of the secrecy. And they would see that the ability to retain that secret recipe for more than 20 years. I mean, we, we can look at KFC and Coca-Cola. They both have secret recipes. But it's different for tea. Tea involves a constantly changing input ratio of tea leaves and they're able to maintain a standard finished product but these inputs do vary so it may be that the brand is where the value lies and we now need to think can a company include a brand that's been developed internally as an intangible asset and i'm sure that you know the answer to that is no. But instead, we might think of the tea taster, who could be the, the key to our consistent flavour. Is it the tea taster that's the intangible asset? Well, we know that there's an awful lot of skill in terms of what the tea tasters do, and they're able to achieve something which is giving the company a lot of value. They are fundamental to the company's future prosperity. And the accounting standards insist in terms of the for an asset to be classified that there must be this sense of control by the entity. And tea tasters are human beings. They're not uh, taken along to work with handcuffs and locked there so they can't do anything else. So as such, we can't classify them as an asset. So we've had a series of clues from the pre-scene and the general conclusion is that it's a mixed bag. We could have a, an intangible assets question, but we've, we've certainly had a bit of a think about these various aspects. Sure, there could be other aspects in terms of the clues, with there may be a development of some computer software that would always be treated as an intangible asset and an, a license agreement perhaps um, to produce tea bags for a particular organisation. So it could be that, say, Forest Supermarkets um, decides that they're going to come to an arrangement with us where we produce some own label tea bags. So revisiting the accounts, we just see in here what went on within the cash flow and you can see how when the, the profit before tax was identified then they added back the one, one million of amortisation which marries up with the reduction in the intangible asset value on the statement of financial position. So there we have it, you can see that there's been no addition 
to intangibles in the year ending the 31st of March 2018. There was a fall in the value and that's almost 5% of our operating profit. So it's, it's a significant amount for us to have amortised over a year. Right, in terms of your exam preparation, IS38 is one of many accounting standards listed in F1. Um, the pre seam provides plenty of opportunities for an exam question, so just think about some possible scenarios. Revise the accounting standards, try to imagine the scenarios, then practice planning and then writing up your answers. Try to do this yourself. If you use somebody else's, it won't stick in your memory anything like as well as it would do if you did it for yourself. I hope to see you for our next recording. Thank you very much.